Welcome to another episode of the history. My name is Kirk and uh, from walhorsecart.com. This is like the weirdest intro. I feel like I'm like, th this is terrible. You want to start over? No, I don't want to start over. This is perfect. <laughs> and with me as always is somebody who's more prepared, better at this than I am, Kate the Disney Cicerone. Kate, how are we doing? We're doing Big Thunder. What's up? <laughs> that was the wildest ride in the wilderness kind of intro that you it's terrible. So I'm not redoing it though. We're, we're doing it live. I don't know how to. I don't know how to follow that. I'm doing okay. Yeah, let's talk Big Thunder. No, it's great. Um, I feel like we're finally getting to actually talk about Big Thunder, which you know, all of the rest of the stuff has been so important. We talked about um, Rainbow Caverns Mine Train. We talked about Mine Train Through Nature's Wonderland. We talked about Thunder Mesa. What happened there to their Mine Train ride? And now we're finally coming to Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. You... Yeah, who would have thought that we had to have 27 episodes before this to actually get to the attraction <laughs> we wanted to talk about? I feel like we knew that. We knew this was going to be a long one, right? Before we started? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty normal when it comes to our longer, uh, longer episodes. But a lot of preface with lots of background and foundation to understand how it seamlessly flows into Big Thunder now. Yeah, no, and I think it's so important to have that context because so much of Big Thunder came from all of the things that came before. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some of that tonight as we dig into it. Do you want to recap a little bit about where we came from this last episode in Walt Disney World? Yeah, what did we do? <laughs> do you want me to do it? I could do it. <laughs> no, we were, we were talking about uh, the Western River Expedition and Thunder Mesa and the concept that uh, Mark Davis had this really grandiose uh, concept for the area of Frontierland uh, because prior to this, there was not going to be planned a pirate's attraction. So it, in actuality, that's really a great transition point because when Walt Disney World opens, uh, there is uh, just a huge clamoring for wanting pirates here. So that's really what pumps the brakes first. There's actually a couple of deterrents for why we don't get Big Thunder immediately. And we're not even into the concept for that. But the, the plan was to have this multi-tiered Thunder Mesa, which had a log flume ride, which had a runaway mine train ride. And it just generally had such an expansive um, level of Frontierland versus what is in existence over in Disneyland. That really got condensed down when they realized they, you know, they built pirates. A lot of the budget went to that, and they just couldn't make it. Um, so Tony Baxter, who was a model maker at the time, had made a sketch about that maybe just pulling the mine train out of that concept and doing it on its own. And that's kind of where we left off: is that in Walt Disney World, this this was for Walt Disney World having the idea of this own mine train ride. wasn't called Big Thunder yet; just was mine train runaway mine train ride. Um, but then this project got put on hold in 1974 because they decided they wanted to develop Space Mountain first. And just a little tiny bit of context with that, um, Walt Disney had talked about Space Mountain um, in an L.A. Times interview in 1965 before he passed away. And then the success of Star Wars and people's fascination with, um, you know, Cape Canaveral, the space program, that really just put anything Old West, including Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, on the shelf because they're like, we're going to go develop all this space stuff focus on Tomorrowland, getting that up and running, because that's what people wanted at the time. But Tony Baxter does say that this delay was probably a good thing for Big Thunder Mountain Railroad because it ultimately produced a smoother ride, because the, uh, the use of computers and attraction design was just getting going in the 1970s, and then it was by the time they made Big Thunder, they had a lot more resources. So ultimately, it ended up benefiting Big Thunder in that way. Yeah, prior to that, especially with uh, even... With Space Mountain, because Space Mountain is the first one that actually uses uh, some blueprints and computer tech to help it become somewhat of a smoother attraction. But it still used a lot of like hand smoothing to, to like yes. form <laughs> the actual attraction. So if you complain that uh, Space Mountain is a very, very bumpy experience, well, this is like the era pre-computers where we now get really, really enjoyable yet thrilling experiences, it still isn't completely perfect when you're doing it pre-computer age. But yeah, for Big Thunder, that was incredible. And in fact, I have I have one thing about just the Pirates uh, transition. So very quickly, uh, WED knew they had a problem moving forward because people were complaining 
listen, I'm not going to go to California to ride the best attraction, the Pirates ride over there. And the thought process, we've talked this before in uh, Distries, that Walt figured Florida is close enough to the Caribbean, so there's no need because the culture and the locals here have already experienced the Caribbean. But Pirates are a little hat. Yeah, yeah. It's just, <laughs> you know. And so so the thought is, you know, they're they're not that interesting because everybody's used to them. But the truth is, that's the number one attraction, so it has to come over here. Budgeting-wise, they were able to cut a few things out because, for example, uh, they didn't need to have the Blue Bayou. They also didn't need to have two cavern sections because it didn't need to go further and lower uh, and use up vacant space that was going to be uh, used for a wax museum in Disneyland. Right. So instead, uh, everybody's like hustling around in the Florida project, trying to make the pirates happen. And in fact, they had uh, buttons made uh, saying the pirates are coming because so many people would uh, be asking questions. Where's pirates? I came here to ride pirates. So it says, uh, so immediately they put aside the Western River ride and began duplicating pirates of the Caribbean with a major reduction in the cavern sequence and eliminating the blue bayou. This sped up construction and reduced the cost considerably, but I still felt we needed, and this is Tony Baxter talking, to finish off the frontier land in Florida. There were boats on the river and the bear bands, but there wasn't a big e-ticket ride. So coming back into 1972, it basically was out of work. If you weren't working on pirates, you had nothing to do. So I thought, what if we were able to develop a plan to build the runaway train ride that crisscrossed the front of the Western River facade, separate from the costly Western River ride itself. So we could put the runaway ride train in now and get to the Western River ride itself later on. So that that's also actually a little bit of a political move, too, uh, because Tony Baxter uh, is taking basically Mark Davis's ideas and taking one part out of it, but not just making the the runaway uh, train, but the thought that later on they can add in the log for log flume ride and and whatnot. So you really thought it would just be like, we'll just do this now, and then we'll add all the rest of the things in later. So you know it'll it'll be fine. <laughs> but they didn't end up doing that because they're just like, no, we're just gonna not do any of the rest of this because this is great. This is great. What you designed is perfect, and if, I don't think that's necessarily what he had intended to do to Mark Davis's project, but that's how it ended up being. So yeah. um, kind of a bummer for that, for Mark Davis, for sure. And we talked a lot about that in our last episode, so we don't need to go over all of that. But that brings you up to speed about where we are now uh, with Big Thunder Mountain Railroad being a Walt Disney World attraction that's now been put on the shelf. So how does it get to Disneyland and how does it get there first before Disney World if it was designed for Disney World first? In order to give a little context to this, we have to uh, talk about Tony Baxter a little bit as a designer. The Big Thunder Mountain Railroad built in Disneyland is the third mountain to be designed for Disneyland after Matterhorn and Space Mountain. Um, and it also is the first major attraction to be added to Disneyland that Walt Disney never had a hand in it. So and it was replacing one of his most beloved attractions. So lots and lots of pressure on Tony Baxter there. Um, this also was the first time Tony Baxter was creative lead on a project. So his background with Disneyland was that in the 1960s, he was scooping ice cream. And then he remembers peeking in as an ice cream scooper cast member in Disneyland when they were building pirates. So he said that there was he walked down the stairs from the cafeteria that was under Blue Bayou, which they called the pit. And he peeked into the jail scene as they were creating Pirates of the Caribbean, um, probably 1966 or 67, when he did this. And instead of chasing him off, Claude Coates, who was working down there at the time, waved him over and gave him a tour of what they were doing, which made an impression on Tony Baxter. That the idea of like, you know, hey, there's somebody who's interested in this, like, let's pull them in and show them more, not just be like, you're not supposed to be down here. Um, and so years later, yeah, I he... think I think the line was, <laughs> hey, as like Tony's like creeping around the staircase, <laughs> Claude Coates is like, you know, you can get a lot. You can't see much up there. You should come down here and I'll show you this thing proper. Right. Tony Baxter said Big Thunder was pretty scary. I had never done anything before as lead designer, but it was also a park filled with everything that Walt Disney had led the initial effort on. So Big Thunder was really the first major change where something differed from Walt's vision. Um, so Haunted Mansion, Pirates, Space Mountain, all of those things that opened even after Walt Disney had passed, 
he had had a lot of creative input into, which is not the case for Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Tony Baxter said a mine car coaster appealed to a new audience, an audience that was raised on speed and thrill, and yet we still had the desire to keep it feeling like part of Disneyland. To talk a little bit about his like design philosophy, I always think it's really fascinating to talk about imagineering design philosophy. Remember, Kirk, when we were in our Jungle Cruise series and we talked and Kevin Lively mentioned about how that with the divers and the swimmers and the waiters? Yeah, exactly. In terms of like what level of guest interest will look and appreciate the details that are within a queue, an attraction, the storyline. Right. So there's three um, qualities that Tony Baxter has when he's designing a ride. First, he says, I don't design anything for the first ride. I design it for the 20th ride. So you start to think, what is that it that's appealing about something that I want to ride it 20 times? So his three qualities to achieve that is uh, one is storytelling. The ride has to take you to a place you couldn't go without Disney. Uh, the second is thrill. Fear minus death equals fun is what Imagineer Eddie Soto said, <laughs> <laughs> which I think is so accurate for Big Thunder, right? And Tony put it, your greatest thrill experiences let you experience what it is to get almost to that point, And then we pull back, especially here at Disneyland, because you know you're safe. So it's like, it's scary, but you know you're safe. So it allows you to be brave in new ways. And then the third is emotional appeal. The one that is more proprietary to Disney than anything is the emotional appeal of an attraction. So he put it in a terms of the um, Dumbo attraction. So the nothing is more simple than it's like it's just a carnival ride, right? It just spins around. There's really nothing that special about that attraction, but the emotional appeal of it transforms it into something else because we connect it with a story. So anything that has emotional appeal as well, we're going to connect to personally and then um, it becomes part of our story as well. If that makes sense. No, because I, I think when uh, <laughs> no. no, no, it's a, no, no, no. <laughs> like I know what you mean, and yes, it makes sense. Because like I think about all the nostalgic reasons for why people go on certain attractions during their trips and when they do it. When do they introduce their kids or their friends to these things? Some of it is not logical or makes sense. It's just your traditions that you've had with your families, and I think those things happen within theme parks. And particularly Disney theme parks uh, due to the storytelling elements of that. Memories can get really folded in when you encapture like a, a great character arc, a beautiful scenario, uh, some sort of thrill or fear or adrenaline pumping scenario. And then couple that in with, with great visualizations and occasionally sense you're there. I mean, it, it's all the, the, the right things for great memories. Right. Well, and that's also what makes it sometimes scary for little children because it feels very, very real, you know, and they, they change. Oh, whatever, them. man. Grow up. No. Get in there, <laughs> you baby. <laughs> no, but I mean, but it also is, teaches us that like, oh, we can do hard and scary things and we still survive yeah. on the other side of it, which I think is such an important lesson for us um, to be able to have. And because there is a lot of really scary, awful, hard things that we have to do in our lives, in our real lives. <laughs> so that having that experience of getting through something harrowing or difficult or crazy and yet surviving the, the other side and maybe even being a bigger person in a more um, more dimensional person because of it, I think is such an important lesson that we get from Disney, from these kids go love. on rides and they're scared. And then afterwards, they're fearless. It's pretty tremendous to watch the transition from when you're in a queue, seeing that nervous anxiety of an adult or a kid, and yeah. then afterwards, almost all of them have the reverse with big grin, laughing, clapping. I want to go again. Like those kind of, those are those great moments where you were able to take somebody who was a little trepidatious and turn it into triumph. Yeah, it's like euphoric. You know, here is like, oh, OK, I can do this. I think we've all seen it, especially in things that are purposely set to be scary, because like obviously roller coasters are one thing um, because there's a level of thrill and there's a level of anxiety and anticipation when you're walking up and you can see like a big lift hill or a really scary looping element, you know, things like that. Um, or the Haunted Mansion, because it's called the Haunted Mansion, even though outside it's not scary at all. It's really not. It's minus the gravestones. It's really all the scariness happens inside. Yeah. You know? 
Yeah, that is intimidating. I feel like the one in Walt Disney World is intimidating when you walk up to it because it's meant to be kind of looming over you for the Haunted Mansion. Yeah, it's it's ominous, but only really at night do I feel like uh, an impending doom. Yeah, you know? that's fair. That's fair. Well, um, with all that being said, that's just a little bit about Tony Baxter as a designer. Um, so as we step into this, we can kind of think about his mindset I do want to say that there are four different big thunders. There is one in Disneyland, Disney World, Tokyo, and Disneyland Paris. Um, and um, Tony Baxter talks about how they all have a different quality to them, except for Tokyo, because it was a direct lift from Walt Disney World, and they wanted it that way. They wanted it to be exactly the same. They didn't want change. They didn't want any other stories because they wanted what the American Park had. So that's the only one that's a, a repeat but uh, he had different words for each of them. So Disneyland's is charming. Walt Disney World's is spectacular. And Disneyland Paris is beautiful. So he went into designing these with those words in mind. And so I feel like as we talk a little bit about the concept for Disneyland and uh, how it got here, we have to think of the word charming because that is what we think of when we think of Disneyland as a park. When he was designing Big Thunder Mountain, they, how it got to Disneyland is they basically decided that Mind Train Through Nature's Wonderland, as we've discussed, all of its ridership went way downhill. And uh, Frontierland was just looking very tired because it lost its stagecoaches, it lost its Conestoga wagons, it's lost its pack mules. It's just got this old, what they call kind of slow and pokey ride, which... What's there to even do? You know, <laughs> right. why do you even exist? They have the like golden horseshoe, but there's really like nothing else going on in this area. So they like we we got to step it up here, especially because now by this point they have Space Mountain um, happening over there, and they're like we need more thrills in this park. So they said, why don't we take that concept, hey Tony, that you kind of thought up in Walt Disney World, and what if we put it in Disneyland in Frontierland? He thought about doing that, um, but it did physically it had to change. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So. I love the concept that when you look at Disneyland versus Disney World, there's a space, um, a conflicting space issue. There's less space to utilize in Disneyland than there is in Walt Disney World. Plus, there's less things in Walt Disney World to impact. So you have more room to work with. You can make it more spectacular, grandiose, where in Disneyland, it had to be more compact and it would be up against, you know, Snow White and Pinocchio's. So right. how do we make it, uh, I think the term that Tony used is more whimsical. So yeah. this is this is before uh, they would send people on awesome uh, trips like Joe Rody. <laughs> they loved clearly, the shade he threw. He definitely Star threw Rody. shade. It was like, oh man, I wish I got to go and hang out in Africa for like, you know, a couple of months uh, while deciding. <laughs> so, uh, so they basically said, if you want some inspiration, we have a bunch of National Geographics. Now, this is before- We got some old National Geographics in the yeah, basement. You could, just, you could literally <laughs> just go look at them if you want. And he's like, okay, <laughs> I'll do that, I guess. And that's where you get the the two different uh, concepts of Bryce Canyon and uh, Monument Valley. I have five pictures from Bryce Canyon because I went there the, like two summers ago. That's so cool that you actually physically went there. Yeah, this know? is this, it's so It's so beautiful. <laughs> It's gorgeous. It's one of my favorite national parks. I know. It's so it's much this... quieter than all the other ones because nobody goes there. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, it's not only is it gorgeous, it's super picturesque. But if you are a Disneyland fan, you immediately are looking at this and going, wow, that looks a lot like Big Thunder. Purposefully so. Yep. So here's the concept art for Disneyland's version of Big Thunder. And you can definitely see um, the hoodoos of Bryce Canyon echoed pretty clearly in the concept art from Bryce Canyon over there on the other side. Who do that voodoo that you do so well? <laughs> well, I loved uh, Tony Baxter's story about the National Geographics because he said not only did he find an article in the book about Bryce Canyon National Park, it says the first line of the article said, when you reach the rim of the canyon in Bryce, you'd think you were looking at something that was crafted by Walt Disney. And I was like, well, there it is, right? Yeah, he, and that solidified it in stone that, you know, all right, I guess we got to do this. Yeah. I have a picture of that tree or one of those trees. I just have to show you this really quick because this is like, this is from when we hiked in that canyon. It gives you so much context, though, for how they made the trees integrate with the rocks because they took so much inspiration from this park. Uh, and look, I mean, you can see, I mean, yours gives such great perspective and you can see how tiny the... Uh, the people are but i mean they're massive 
Well, look at this. This is my family, and those are the rocks. So you can see just how massive these rocks are. And real, real original. Would you like steal this person's picture? <laughs> just, just kidding. Do you have to worry about like flash flooding in there? Um, not in this one, no. Okay. But there are areas you do, but no, not where we were because I didn't want to take my kids somewhere that was unsafe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. I also love how talking about just uh mine train through nature's wonderlands they do have natural arches too which i thought was really cool mm -hmm. anyway they modeled it off of bryce canyon national park and uh the way tony baxter put it was the charming and fanciful rock formations of bryce canyon which i think is a really accurate way of putting it and that became the basis of the disneyland version is all of these magical hoodoos <laughs> they had to make it this charming fanciful notion because they had to make it fit organically next to fantasy land because even though you don't usually like see one from the other because of the way the trees have grown and all those things it really has to co be cohesive as a park everything has to feel right it has to feel just as fanciful and magical as you know the castle that you're walking from because everything's very very close together in disneyland compared to disney world right Mainly unless you're talking about batu that thing is <laughs> literally on another planet <laughs> it is it's like back in the south 40 in that park that is true but ironically you can see it from virtually everywhere in frontierland and new orleans square <laughs> so <laughs> that's when they don't hide very well Alrighty. so the tip of big thunder mountain reflects the same massing as the tip of the petrified tree in frontierland so this is something that a lot of people don't know about the design of this and this ha this comes from Tony Baxter is wanting to integrate this as well as possible in Frontierland so it feels organic and also honor um, Walt Disney's Frontierland at the same time. So if you notice the the very top of that looks so much like what we see at the top of our Big Thunder as well. So you can see how it echoes that sign. So if you don't know about the petrified tree, there's a lot of... <laughs> people that believe the story that is on the tree is actually what happened with it. Um, but let me tell you what, what the real story is. <laughs> this uh, is touted as Walt Disney's anniversary gift to his wife for uh, Lillian. So what happened was Walt and Lillian went on a road trip in 1956 and they stopped at the Pike Forest Fossil Beds on July 11th, uh, 1956. So Lillian waited in the car for like a super long time. And she's like, what is he doing in there? Like, come on, like I'm waiting out here in the car. What's going on? So this is a quote from Roy Disney said he was gone quite a long time. And when he came back, he knew she would be provoked with him. It was near their anniversary. So he said, honey, I bought you an anniversary present. So Walt had purchased a, a piece of petrified tree, which is a 10 foot high stump weighing in at five tons and it was purchased for the sum of $1,650. The stump is believed to have come from a tree that stood over 200 feet tall, um, and Walt's intention was always to buy it for Disneyland. So it was never actually an anniversary gift. It's just kind of like that was part of their inside joke between the two of them was that it was an anniversary gift because she was a little bit perturbed at him. He jokingly gave it to Lillian for their 31st anniversary, and she said it's too big for a, the mantle and gave it to Disneyland, quote unquote gave it to Disneyland. So when an early handwritten draft of the tree's plaque did include the quip too large for the mantle, the letter Walt drafted to John Baker, proprietor of Pike's Forest, read, it is my understanding that you will deliver the stump direct to Disneyland at Anaheim, California within 30 days, along with the approximately one ton of small pieces of petrified stone. Asked about this years later, Diane Disney Miller said, of course it was staged. It was very playful on both their parts. The gift to my wife was just a gag. He, Walt, was the consummate gag man and proud of it. It's difficult to believe that others didn't see this episode that way. So over time, this story's just been a little bit lost where people now think it actually was an anniversary present, but it wasn't. It was just a fun joke between a husband and a wife for Disneyland. And they're accountant because guess what? Gifts can't get taxed. <laughs> This tax season. That's a very timely joke. It was, dude. It was like, <laughs> oh man, we gotta we gotta bring our tax burden down sixteen uh, fifty. Uh, just buy that thing. All right, it's the tree, the petrified tree. Buy that. It's so heavy. I don't care. Um, I will say that the Disneyland tracks from the design in Walt Disney World had to be flipped in reverse. 
if you've ever gone to both of them and you wondered why Disneyland's turns one way most of the time and Disney World's turns the other, um, that is because they had to reverse the entire uh, way that the tracks work because of the space where they had to put it in Disneyland with my yeah. train through nature's wonderland. So it's, it's purely a space issue. Well, well, Wed actually hired an independent contractor by the name of Missy Elliott and she flipped it and reversed it. <laughs> I think she actually put the thing down first before she flipped it and reversed it. <laughs> That makes so much sense. I think. Yeah, that's just what makes it easier, you know? <laughs> so I will say that because of the way that they flipped it and reversed it, <laughs> I'm never going to be able to think about it, but besides any other way with that now. Yep. So thanks for that. <laughs> You're welcome. The, because of the way the layout was, um, we'll talk more about this when we get into Walt Disney World, but there's a part of it that's basically a flash flood that is on one side of the Walt Disney World version. Um, but that is where Pinocchio and Snow White, the, the show building, is in Disneyland. So they couldn't put the same thing there that they had planned for Walt Disney World. So they created a tunnel called Coyote Canyon to keep guests from seeing the backside of the show building. And that creates a little extra thrill as well. So they did have to adjust the layout ever so slightly. And when we actually do our walkthrough of the ride, we'll show you what Coyote Canyon looks like. And uh, it is it is different than Walt Disney World in that way. But a lot of the tracks, very, very similar layout in terms of um, how the tracks are laid out. Other than that, do you have anything else for just like the basic concept of it? Uh, we didn't show or talk about the model. Do we want to do that? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we should do that. You know, because, uh, you know, I think this was another thing that was great from uh, that Tony Baxter thing talking about how. If you're going to try to sell an attraction to like a board, a, a painting does a really great job, but his background was in model work. So, and again, there's something about the tactile feel of working with a model and uh, to put things in perspective, I'll show you a picture of it and I have, I have a bunch, but uh, this thing, it was the scale was basically that you would be about an inch and a half high and it was, it was massive. It was beautiful. And they still use tactile models while building now, but so much more reliant on CGI, AI, and computer virtual landscapes. But I, I think there's something just beautiful about this. And in fact, you can still, is it the same one? Like the actual physical one that's in the Disneyland Hotel, or is that a facsimile or a replica? Oh, I that's a replica. It out there. It's a replica. But yeah. is it is it of the same, like it's pretty much the same, or is it completely different? No, I think it's pretty close to the original model. They just That's made cool. a replica of it. Yeah. So it's not the real one, but it is cool. If you go to the Disneyland Hotel and it's in the Frontierland Tower, you can see a model of Big Thunder Mountain Railroad there. Now, there are some fun things when you look at the model that we can pull out from previous episodes and build on our, our old information is that you notice that there is a T-Rex down here, <clears throat> which is a call out to the Living Desert. And the dinosaur bones that they had there. Remember, there was a rattlesnake inside one of its like eye socket areas. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have uh, Rainbow Ridge. So, which is, again, another call out to that town. I think mine is an earlier version than yours. Mine has a lot more tall trees in it. Yeah, I think yours is the one that a 24-year-old built. <laughs> That's possible. Look, I do have a picture of somebody with a train then the trains are yellow do you notice oh no mm -hmm. not green trains <laughs> get watch well, out no it's interesting that though that they were planning yellow trains potentially for big thunder mountain railroad t as a nod to uh mine train through nature's wonderland mm -hmm. and then they must have changed their color at some point because in this actual model here the train is red and green as you can see yeah so very interesting for that um, I will say that the Rainbow Ridge, the town of Rainbow Ridge, the inspiration for that, again, is the ghost towns left over from the California Gold Rush officially for Big Thunder. Of course, it's a nod to the original Rainbow Ridge that they had for Mind Drain Their Nature's Wonderland. Do you have anything else on the just overall concept before we transition to those? No. 
So let's transition here a moment to Discovery Bay and just talk about a little bit of it. We're not going to do a deep dive into that. That would be its own episode because it's got so much to it. Uh, but it was linked to Big Thunder Mountain Railroad in the beginning. And then when that concept fell away, we're kind of missing half of the story, so to speak, because of that. So Tony Baxter pitched a new land adjacent to Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, which was Discovery Bay. This was 19. 19- uh, 74 that he did this. So the two areas were supposed to complement each other and have intertwining backstories. Discovery Bay was a scientific outpost in the style of San Francisco's Barbary Coast and a celebration of the Victorian age of invention. So San Francisco of the 1850s and 1880s with like a lot of Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, those kinds of elements to it. Very steampunk, so to speak. Which, which park all of that because we will no good idea gets thrown away. That mm-hmm. will come back once we head back to Disneyland Paris later on. Indeed. It was supposed to coincide with the 1974 release of the film, The Island at the Top of the World. So this all would have been connected to that. So it was tucked behind Tom Sawyer Island. So you can think of kind of where Batu is now. Um, plus like the area right behind Big Thunder. That's where this all would have taken place, right? So the featured attractions would have been uh, the Nautilus, so a simulator submarine adventure and restaurant set in the Grand Salon of the Nautilus. The Island at the Top of the World attraction where guests would journey aboard the Hyperion and find the lost civilization of Astrogard in the Arctic. Uh, The Lost River Rapids, which is a rapids ride featuring dinosaurs relocated from the primeval world diorama, so they would have repurposed those. Um... The Fireworks Factory, which was a uh, gallery based around uh, like shooting fireworks at targets. And then the Spark Gap Loop, which is a roller coaster using magnetic technology. And Professor Marble's Gallery, a carousel theater show featuring strange, unusual things. Professor Marble, by the way, is the one that had this curious little green dragon that might look a little bit familiar because he later turned purple and then became Figment. So that's where we get Figment from. That's a whole other story in itself, but <laughs> we won't get bogged down there. They also had Professor Marvel's Balloon Descent, which is a Skyway type ride experience that would connect Discovery Bay to the proposed uh, Dumbo Circus Land expansion for Fantasyland. Um, The Sailing Ship Columbia, which they do have in Disneyland, but it would have a new loading dock for the long running Rivers of America staple that would have been built there, uh, eliminating the need for the attraction to share one with the Mark Twain Riverboat. Because right now, if you're in Disneyland, there's Fowler's Harbor is where they park the boats when they're not using them but that means only one boat at a time can be parked there so the other one has to be just docked at like the uh the loading area so this would make it so they both had a place to park for the night so to speak the later plans also would have had it permanently docked to become a restaurant and then also the disneyland railroad would have been had a train station there in discovery bay as well we won't talk too much more about that except that we would have had a tunnel going under the railroad tracks to Geyser Falls, which was a signature thrill ride meant for Discovery Bay. This thrill ride called Geyser Falls would have guests experience a dormant geyser as it roared back to life and propelled them skyward um, in a mineshaft elevator through a reimagined Rainbow Caverns area. And the geyser would then blast your ride vehicle up a mineshaft and then later became um, later became a geyser mountain concept, which we'll talk about more in a minute and get a little bit more deeply into that. So this is the backstory that would have tied Discovery Bay to Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and would have made sense of everything that was going on in this area. So it is the backstory of Jason Chandler, who lived in a town called International Village in Big Thunder region around 1849. He invented a drilling machine capable of boring into Big Thunder Mountain, where the veins of gold ran so deep it was rumored that they could produce a mother load that would bring a man enough wealth to last a hundred lifetimes and more. Unfortunately, there was a mine cave-in which buried 26 miners, and uh, Jason Chandler and his drilling machine were called into action to rescue the miners. Just as they emerged from the mine, a massive earthquake shook the ground, opened a rift in the earth and swallowed Chandler and the drill. The miners tried to rescue him, but Jason Chandler disappeared and all of the gold in the mountain was buried with him. So it says the mountain had gone bust and it became just a matter of time before only ghosts resided there. 
Um, unknown to everyone else, though, Jason Chandler survived the incident, but knowing the wealth of gold could easily be abused, chose to use the gold to fund research for any inventor whose odd ideas had been turned down by everyone else. So he met with Ned Land to locate and salvage the Nautilus from its watery grave. This is where we kind of get like the backstory then for Discovery Bay, right? So Jason Chandler is incorporated into the Society of Explorers and Ventures, uh, SEA, um, membership being described as the leader of the late 1800s era version of the group. And then he does have like a tag that's on one of the, the stagecoaches in Disneyland. On the one of the suitcases, it does say Jason Chandler on it. So if you're looking, you're in Disneyland, you can see his name here. Mine is the newer one. I think yours is the older one because they refurbed that stagecoach. Um, also in the paddle in the tropical hideaway, there's a paddle coming in from 1882 trip on the uh, Ella, Elahu River in British Columbia. So he has a paddle there. And then in the SCA room of the Skipper Canteen, which we've talked about before, there's a map on the wall made by Jason Chandler and Captain Brieu of the Hyperion airship charting legendary flying beast in the Mekong River. So um, also... He's a member of a group of bandits in the comics, which I think you showed. You showed that, Kirk, right? Mm -hmm. It was based off of the bandits designed by Mark Davis for the unbuilt Western River Expedition attraction developed for the Magic Kingdom. So that's what they based those cartoons off of, which I think is really interesting. So let's let's put this all together. So the concept is that Big Thunder Mountain originally has all of this, this mining uh, ore in it. So they want to extract it. And this still is to today what the ha what basically happens, except for there is no Jason Chandler uh, because that Discovery Bay arc gets dropped when they decide to not do that expansion. So instead, we have um, each one of the mountains has its own distinct uh, natural disaster that happens that basically is like cursing the mountain or saying like, hey, you're abusing or using our resources in Disneyland and in Paris, they're the same, right? They're both earthquakes. Yeah. And then Tokyo is a tsunami. And then in Walt Disney World, it's geysers or a flash flood from underwater springs. Yeah. Or so, at least this was what it was when they opened. They've all yeah. kind of adjusted since then. But yes. Yeah. Like Barnabas T. Bullion. We don't, we're not getting to him yet. Nope. <laughs> He's later. Too early. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Fun fact, it's just Tony Baxter, but we'll talk about that later. Shh, don't so give it away. <laughs> so one of the other things I discovered was uh, Discovery Bay would have also accompanied a television miniseries, The Discovery Bay Chronicles, which would have told the story of the area, which is so interesting because it pulls it back into those very early days of um, Disneyland when they were doing the Disneyland TV show. And they had Davy Crockett to get people excited about Frontierland. And so it's the very same kind of concept for this. But like, I, I feel like that works so hand in hand. Now, the the benefit of Disneyland coming uh, way later is there this massive catalog of greatest hits cartoons that they can pull from. So all these animated features that were fantastic that they can build attractions around that already has an inlaid audience of adults who grew up with it. And then their kids who have been introduced or are being introduced to the new characters. So I I always have felt that has been huge. Um, and then the other thing that that Disney, I felt, did better than almost any other theme park is creating their own original IP that only lives and breathes in the parks. I mean, we saw a piece of this with Discovery Bay and Dreamfinder and Figment. And then we get them in Epcot. Like Figment is a staple, but does not exist outside of the parks, which is really unique uh, from a, from just a concept of of a theme park creating a character specific to just the theme park, but it has its own cartoon offshoots of it. It's, it's wild. Yeah, like I think there's potential for that with like the Chubby character. The Chubby is such a, a wonderful like. <laughs> don't look at me like you, that. <laughs> I am looking at you like that. Nobody. No. Chuby is beloved, beloved, <laughs> but they haven't done anything. 
No, I said that's potential. That's why I use yeah. the word potential. Okay. Because okay. <laughs> they could. Because he's he was designed for a theme park attraction. He was not like in any other thing besides that. You know that. I, he, you know what I think is that. is an even crazier one is Orange Bird because it's straight up the Florida Citrus Commission. <laughs> so it's an ad for orange juice, but we all love Orange Bird. It's such a weird thing. It's a commercial. What are you talking about, we don't. It's, know. A, it's, it's a commer. It's a crummy commercial, <laughs> dude. When if you put put all the stars together, it's don't forget to drink your orange juice. <laughs> is what it'll say. What a weird way of of like promoting orange juice, though. Like, really, it's like a, a bird that can't talk, and he just like has little thought bubbles, thought <laughs> and bubbles. he gets rejected by like his friends and families. Great, great song. <laughs> Great original song. <laughs> it's a wonderful song. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. They they really, I feel like they got what they paid for. Yeah, more than what they paid for. So why wasn't Discovery Bay created? Well, the Island at the Top of the World movie really didn't do well in the box office. Like, if I said Island at the Top of the World, you probably weren't being like, yeah, that's my favorite Disney movie of all time. Like, Avatar? <laughs> I just say it like it's not it's not um, one that ever did well in the box office. So the project didn't get greenlighted because of that, which is such a bummer, because I think even without the movie success, I think that land probably still could have like held its own. I think Tony Baxter said it was on the front end of like the steampunk movement. So it really would have done well uh, with that. But Discovery Bay, he said, was probably one of the biggest disappointments for me. I still believe that to visit a Julesburn place along a frontier river where this eclectic collection of inventors, dreamers, and schemers um, are being funded to create their visions of the future would have been a fabulous place to see. So when the island came and went, so did the Discovery Bay concept. And it wasn't that we had a bad idea. It was the fact that we tied it to weak property, weak IP. That's That was what killed it. But How does it feel to be disappointed, Tony? <laughs> Ooh... <laughs> I mean, pretty. No. <laughs> I mean, come on, dude. Like, that's it was. It's Mark Davis all over. Two point oh. It is it building is true. These great. You know, man. I was I was reading when Mark retired, and he basically was he was creating all these concepts in the seventies, and nobody was paying attention to him. Like he was yeah. creating like all of these different attractions, and yeah. no one was paying attention or listening or yeah. watching. It's like he just became completely not relevant, even though. He had designed basically the texture of every single nostalgic, amazing, epic attraction that we had from the beginning all the way until uh, like the early 70s. And it just gets like thrown away. Yeah. Thrown away. And, They're like, and oh, that's I nice. Like, Sit down. I, yeah. I feel like that's yeah. how they felt about him. Yeah. And he just was like, I don't know if I got fired or quit, but I just felt like I wasn't contributing. So I just said, I'm done. Yeah, and I, that like broke my heart about that. I, yeah. It was awful to read that today. I just Even I didn't realize it was that wonderful ideas. And yeah, to have people just pretty much ignore them. It's like the leadership was really struggling in that time period, and so it makes sense why it happened. Well, it was, but it it's was awful that it happened. Well, I mean the the post the post Walt era was a real struggle, both for mm -hmm. animation. And for attractions, it just, it really, really, really struggled until we got the Disney Renaissance, you know? So, yeah. And I will say, you know how I feel about Michael Eisner. However, uh, if... hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yep. 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 Whoa. Uh huh. If Mark Davis had made that stuff in the Michael Eisner era, if Mark Davis had been able to find a way to tie it to IP that Michael Eisner had, it probably would have get, gotten greenlit. I will say that. And <laughs> at 9.33 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on February 16, 2024, Michael Eisner would have done the right thing. <laughs> says Kate the Disney With Frank Cicero. Wells. With Frank Wells. Both of them together. That's all I'm saying. Dream team. Um, the dream team. All that being said, so Discovery Bay didn't work. They did try to revive it in 1984, uh, but Jack Lindquist estimated the cost of the project would exceed $55.5 million, which was money earmarked for New Fantasyland instead. Uh, so that would it would take two or three years to build, so it was shelved. It was just too expensive, too big, too much, and they, they already had to deal with basically bulldozing Fantasyland and rebuilding it from scratch because everything was falling apart in it. So that's what that's what really was the nail in the coffin of Discovery Bay, and it was done. However, 
a portion of Discovery Bay did come back to the table. And this was in the late 1980s-ish for Disneyland and then also Disneyland Paris. So uh, Imagineer Bob Berenick was the one that was leading the project for Geyser Mountain. So remember we had Geyser Falls that was kind of paired with this story. Well, Geyser Mountain was an attempt to make something decent out of the old Cascade Peak, which we remember we talked about how it got dismantled and torn down around this time period um, where they they were threatening to remove Cascade Peak from Frontierland. They're like, whoa, let's hold on. Whoa, like, let's figure out something we could do with this area. Let's look back at this old concept that Tony brought up of, you know, Geyser Falls, Geyser Mountain. So this was a ride that was developed after they had started developing the technology for Tower of Terror. Uh, But this was before California Adventure was greenlit. Um, So Tower of Terror opened in 1994, but they were developing the technology in the late 80s before that. Um, This was going to be a new drop ride that was themed to Frontierland. And versions were being developed for Disneyland and Disneyland Paris, but the mountain was home for to Jason Chandler. So this character that we were talking about that invented this drilling machine, this was his house. This was his home. <laughs> and uh, what Kirk's showing you there is more of the Disneyland Paris version because it differs a little bit from the Disneyland version. And this is something that was made by a fan because there's very, very little uh, yeah, there concept. Yeah, isn't really there. good concept art. Like I have this... Uh, like blueprint blueprint sketch of it, of what the house would have looked like for Disneyland Paris. Um, but uh, a fan basically made kind of like a walk through the outside um, just to give you an idea of what it would have looked like. But the Disneyland version was a little bit different. So um, essentially would have been like a extension of Big Thunder from the exit of Big Thunder. So the queue would have been um, a whole bunch of geothermal activity, like the living desert in Mind Train Through Nature's Wonderland. They would have had mud pots and small geysers. Then you'd see a whole bunch of like weird machines along the path that you can't really tell what they are. So it's kind of hinting that like an inventor lives here. Uh, and then you see giant holes dug by the mining equipment, which is the same drilling machine used for Big Thunder Mountain. So they were test holes. Um, you'd see a house with a barn attached, which is kind of like this, but this is more of like the fancier Disneyland Paris version. Um, and then the house that you see there that Kirk was showing you was made to resemble the Wrigley Chewing Gum Mansion on Catalina Island in California because the Imagineer Pat Burke loved the roof details of it. So I have a picture of that. You can see it's kind of like a canonical top to it um, that got transferred over to that design. So you'd walk through this really eccentric inventor's house into the adventurous study and you'd see colorful crystals and enormous geodes that he discovered while tum- tunneling under the geyser mountain if you remember when we talked about mineral hall very much the same kind of concept with these giant crystals and minerals. yeah that that place rocks <laughs> so then you'd also see a whole bunch of black and white photographs of stalagmite and stalactite formations and a hand-drawn map of Geyser Mountain with a giant geyser featured in the center. And then there was a note on it that was foreshadowing. It said, uh, it was a note on the map from 1920 that said, Reminder to self, temporary bridge has been taking an awful pounding from geyser eruptions, must remember to make repairs. So then you'd go to the barn load area and hop aboard some mining vehicles that are uh, what Chandler used to bore into Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And apparently they were supposed to look like the vehicle that Gaten Moliere uh, drove in when he was tunneling under the earth in Atlantis, the Lost Empire. Then in the Disneyland version, you would journey through colorful caves like the Rainbow Caverns. So we'd essentially get the Rainbow Caverns back (laughs) with giant glowing crystals added to it. Um, You travel around the mountain and see references to nature's wonderland. Then you'd reach the top of the mountain and discover that a landslide has blocked the return route. So you'd have no choice but to go across the rickety bridge that they had warned you about in the house. You'd move over the creaky bridge hanging over a dark chasm. And in the middle of the bridge, the the bridge kind of starts to sag and the vehicle leans to one side like you're going to fall in. And then suddenly you're launched into the air as a geyser erupts with superheated water. And the vehicle would kind of like bounce up and down a few times on the top of the geyser getting you a view of the surrounded area of uh, Frontierland. And the force of the water would push you out of the chasm uh, and bridge area and land on the rim of Geyser Mountain. Uh, Then you travel back down to the unload area and then it would be done. 
So the Disneyland Paris version, which is what Kirk is showing you there, just a little bit different. And it's kind of like Tower of Terror in reverse. So really interesting. They use the same ride system, but it was run in reverse. So you would descend deep into the ground and then explode upward, uh, riding atop the powerful geyser. So yeah, I, I wish this happened. This yeah. would have been so cool. Doesn't it sound amazing? Yeah, and, and thematically, I think it's unique. It it makes sense on how the technology would work in terms of it being more naturally based, even though you're in an inventor's area. I guess, like, the real question is, why would you build housing around the geysers, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it is. But that so is cool. kind of maybe because it's an eccentric inventor, you know. So right. wants he to needs like to do. Look at the wants, geyser. He wants to live near bump. his work. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting part of the Disneyland Paris one is uh, they would enter into these tunnels and caverns, like the Carlsbad Caverns in New Mexico, and the elevators would descend into the mine tunnels. So it's like a really different concept. Instead of a cavern, it's like going into the mine. Um, where various mining operations would be observed as the elevator doors open on different levels. So think of Tower of Terror, very like similar to that. Then the car descends deeper into the fabled Rainbow Caverns, so and that's where they have their Rainbow Caverns. And the elevator operators then given safety clearance to continue down to the deepest caverns, where the thermal activity sometimes makes visits impossible. But today, of course, it's all safe and we can go, right? Uh, but as we descend, ominous rumblings increase, and guests are able to briefly see the glowing heat bed fissures before massive thermal eruptions force the cabin back upward all the way to the top of the mine shaft tower. The elevator cab thrusts upward and slips back downward and the ever increasing thermal geyser belching out steam beneath the cab, like the 1959 version of Journey to the Center of the Earth. Um, then they break free of the earth and then the geyser stops with the cab motionless for an instant and then they fall back downwards landing deep in the earth on a pillowy cushion of receding steam. And then they're able to regain control of the chat, the cab, and then you kind of go back up and then it's all over. But like, how amazing does that sound? <laughs> Please and thank you. Build it. <laughs> right. And so I'm like, why in the world did we not get this? Either like either one. I don't even care which one we get. Like, give us one of those in Frontierland. And uh, they really thought it would be greenlit. They had models and plans drawn up uh, with the Tower of Terror technology. Um, and then they even tore down Cascade Peak in 1998 thinking it would be easier to get the project greenlit because it was not there anymore so that the, the cost would be less. So that's why they tore down Cascade Peak, not just because it was falling apart, but because they're like, so we can make room for this new cool thing. However, Tower of Terror became so popular in Hollywood Studios or MGM um, that it canceled the pro this project as they decided to bring Tower of Terror to California Adventure to try to save the park, which we've talked about in the past. That park needed a lot of help after it got after it opened in 2001 so they decided they couldn't have two rides with the same tech open around the same time which is right back with where we were with pirates and western river expedition all over again and also they had a lot of technical reasons like the attraction was housed underground it was impossible to disguise a 13-story tower in disneyland's frontierland if they were going to make the same one as disneyland paris um, so there, there was also a problem with capacity because tower of terror had four to six elevator entries and it would have been difficult to create a scene that looked believable and made room for the mine elements. So there was like a whole bunch of issues with it. Um, and so they just kind of canceled it as a project. They're like, we're already putting it in across the way. Like, we don't need it over here. We're done. Yeah. And they, right, exactly. Which makes sense. I get it. I always think when, when every time a project doesn't happen, I just go, what would have Walt done? Because yeah. I think about that, that same story about, Claude Coates and the Rainbow Caverns and wa wanting to do the different multicolored like waterfalls. Yeah. And basically he's like, I want every color of the rainbow, but they can't mix because then all the colors won't look the same as the water is cascading over. And he's like, uh, so like everyone at the table is like, basically, yeah, this is not possible. And like Walt just like tapped on the table and said, who thinks they can do it? And it's like Claude was like, I, I think I could do it. And he's like, <laughs> You're in charge of the Rainbow Caverns. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I love, I think about that all the time is like, yeah, it's fun to do the impossible. And um, I hate when logic gets in the way of creativity. 
Me too. But it's really the solution to that was so simple. It was like using what, like almost like Brillo pads, like the texture of like. Yeah. To like dampen the, the landing. It was like splash. a soft landing. Yeah. So there was so, a splash. Yeah. But that's where that quote, it's kind of fun to do the impossible comes from. So this Walt said like, well, we're going to do it anyway. Even though like all the experts were like, no, you can't do this. Can't be done. Can't be done. But that's. That's what I mean. Like there, there's a, I understand how businesses operate in terms of like financial needs and logistics, but doing something that's so unique and so different that has guests and it has other theme parks scratching their heads is what put Disney parks ahead of everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we've been a little too comfortable with the fact that they've done that for so long that some of that collective risk taking has been removed from the creative process. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I look forward to what's going to happen in the future with Disney Parks. Be thing. I think that $16 billion influx over the next decade is going to change a lot. Yeah, and you look back on a lot of these early attractions they made in Disney and you realize they were innovators. They were such innovators. Like everything they did, they were reinventing the wheel or just creating something that had never existed before. Um, and we'll see some of that as we continue on in the series as they are creating Big Thunder. They even have some ways of creating things that they'd never done before. They didn't know how to do it. So they had to figure it out. And then yeah, that became the standard, right? Yeah, they talked about that with uh, creating the tiki room animatronic birds. They were like, we need to get feathers. So they would like go to a craft store and buy feathers. Like, right. like there, there was no manual. And then when they did it, people were like, oh, well, that's obviously how you would do this. That's how you make animatronic birds. Like, right. yeah, that had I mean, never been done before. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I feel like it's such an inspiration to us because I feel like it's so easy to get stuck in our boxes of like this, like we can't go beyond here because that's all we know, because that's all that's ever been done. But it's never been done because nobody has done it yet. That's the only reason, you know? So really not limiting ourselves to this. This is as far as we can go because that's how, how much is known, really stepping out into that unknown. I think that's what Imagineering did so well that put them, you know, Disney parks, uh, so far above and beyond everyone else because they weren't afraid to take those creative risks. I think I agree with you about that. Again, this is uh, <laughs> 9.47 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 16, 2024. Kate agrees with me. It's two tonight. <laughs> I know you're on a roll. <laughs> I I am. Um, I do, before we leave this Geyser Mountain concept, I just want to say um, there were attempts to put it in the other parks, like we mentioned Disneyland Paris, but there was also an attempt to put it in Walt Disney World in 1994 near Big Thunder Mountain. So it would have been tied to that attraction, Same similar backstory. And I have a quote, um, I think this is from Don Goodman. I said Florida would have had to build it up on the mountain to escape the water table issues that they had. But there was a steel railroad rotating bridge behind Big Thunder at Walt Disney World for the park train that would have tied into the geyser attraction quite well. So almost got it there, but didn't. Who knows? We're going beyond Frontierland. That's the next frontier for Maybe Walt they're gonna Disney resurrect World Geyser Kingdom. Mountain. <laughs> Maybe. How amazing would that be? It'd be cool. I think yeah. um, I, I would love to see how they could incorporate new tech to make it really, really something fantastic. Because I do think Tower of Terror is wonderful and people love it. And the concept of drop towers is really unique. And if they made it so well themed that like even when you were going up the mine shaft, like visually, they could really make it spectacular with the steam. And I think even though it's still a similar concept, it would blow people away. Yeah. Especially well, with storyline. Oh gosh. Even if, if they put if they brought back original elements like the rainbow caverns and all that stuff too, you know, like there there's also that element of nostalgia there for a lot of people that I think they could really play into as well. Um so I really oh gosh, I have so such high hopes. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what happens, I guess. <laughs> I think that's where we're going to pause this episode until next time. Like we said, we don't 
we don't have a set number of episodes for this, so we get to talk about it as much as we want. So, <laughs> so. deal. <laughs> but I think it's important that this gives so much context behind, you know, the inventor that was supposed to make the machine that bored the holes into Big Thunder. Like all of this is so intertwined with Big Thunder Mountain's history. I it's still not... can't believe they let miners on that ride. Uh... <laughs> We're, we're definitely going to keep going uh, next week <laughs> um, with the construction of uh, Big Thunder Mountain in Disneyland and then start walking through the attraction and riding through the attraction um, to point out a lot of the things that uh, you might have missed, some details that in the design. So, um, And then eventually we will get to Walt Disney World, we'll hop to Tokyo and Disneyland Paris and all those things, but... We got to do Disneyland first because it's the one that opened first. Well, shall we wrap up then? Let's pull this train into the station. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for this episode of Distory. We hope that it gave you a little extra context into um, how Big Thunder Mountain Railroad ended up in Disneyland and also some of the backstory of it that maybe disappeared over time as we lost part of it to Discovery Bay. Kirk, do you have any final thoughts as we wrap up here? Nope. <laughs> okay Alrighty. well thank you everybody for joining us and we will see you next time for distory